Acts chapter 9, we're going to kick off a new teaching series. It's not a new passage to us. In fact, some of the teaching will sound familiar, especially the first half. It's where we get the name Mercy Road from. It's where Saul encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus and becomes Paul, who will change the course of human history. But before we get into all of that in this new teaching series called Revenge of the Saints, I at least wanted to acknowledge Pastor Luke did a phenomenal job last weekend and be sure and tell him that. In fact, he was so personally excited about it, he said he would buy lunch for the 1130 service. Uh, be sure and tell him that out in the lobby when you see him. Uh, Pastor Luke's amazing. So as we kick off this new teaching series this morning, we spent four weeks doing MVPs of the OT, the Old Testament, had this sports theme. It was right up my alley, man. And then we decided for two weeks we're doing this teaching series called Revenge of the Saints, Fight Back with Grace and Love. It's got a Star Wars theme to it. And as you saw in the video, it was like with Eric Maitland, we released the Kraken on this one, man. He's, he, he refers to sports as the sports ball, but like he knows every line you've ever heard in any Star Wars movie. So he's actually releasing Sunday set lists every week uh, in the Star Wars theme. I think next week he's singing uh, Luke, You Are My Good, Good Father the, the following weekend. It's like, uh, I think it was like Marvelous Lightsaber or something like that. So. Don't miss it. Oh, how great thou Yoda is one of his personal favorites he'll be sharing with you. So we're going to have some fun just two weeks with this, and there is a point to it. In fact, what I'd like to share with you is this kind of light and darkness theme and how we fight back in a society and culture where it's often really dark. And we do it with grace and love as Christians. In fact, you don't have to look very far today in our society to see the darkness around us. I mean, just this weekend, there was another shooting. It was on CNN uh, in Pomona, California, which is the city I ministered in and my wife did for seven years. And two police officers were shot. A 30-year-old officer was killed. And it's just, you know, it's hard. I've seen all these posts from our church family out there. We know that violence exists today. We see it all the time. Threats in the last year of nuclear war. There's anger and animosity right here in the United States, and we love to fight and argue through social media, and we say really mean things to each other sometimes, and you see the things going on in our schools and just around our culture and society today. And what I'd like to share with you is not any political statements. What I'd like to share with you is what it looks like as a Christian to live in a culture in which it's not directly following Jesus, that we as Christians are called to be a light in the darkness to bring grace into a world that needs it desperately. And that's what we fight back with. This week I'll be talking about fighting back with grace. Next week it'll be love. And this week in particular, I think it's important for us as a church because this passage is where we get our name and it comes, it's where we get our mission statement from. That we believe we exist as a church because we want to see people far from God. Right? We talk about being a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And we mean that. The people far from God could actually be discipled into a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. That they be could become followers of Jesus who are truly living out uh, differently in this world. And we have seen atheist, agnostic, and beyond people come in, worship with us for years, and eventually have their lives transformed. And I'm going to share one of those in just a moment. But Acts chapter 9, I told you we would start there. And it's the story of Saul, who becomes Paul. We named the church Mercy Road because nobody was farther from God than Saul. And because of an encounter with Jesus, it so dramatically changes his life, he becomes Paul, who starts churches all over the Roman Empire, writes 40 to 50% of our New Testament, and transforms the course of human history. But at one time, he was actually overseeing the killing of Christians. In Acts chapter 6, we know that Stephen, one of the first deacons, was stoned to death by the Pharisees. And, and Paul, Saul at that time, was not only a Pharisee, he was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He studied under Gamaliel. Apparently, he's like some important rabbi. And Saul looks on to the stoning in Acts 6 and says that he approves of it. By Acts chapter 9, he's going up to Damascus and ripping Christians out of their home and throwing them into prison back in Jerusalem. Are you guys ready to study God's word together, church? Here we go. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul, 
was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners in Jerusalem. At this time, they were not called Christians yet. It's not until Acts chapter 11 in the church in Antioch that they will first be called Christians, which means little Christ or followers of the Christ, Jesus. At this time, they're just referred to as the way of some uh, sect of Judaism, of the Jewish faith. And it's at this time that, that Paul, Saul, is going and taking Christians. He's putting them into prison for their faith. Verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus for three days. He was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I, I love this passage for many reasons, but the one I'd like to focus on is that Saul becomes Paul and does all these great things for the kingdom, not because somebody came into his life and said, you're a, you're a horrible human being, right? You're really bad. You oversaw the, I mean, he was bad. He killed, helped oversee the killing of Stephen. He was a religious terrorist in his own day. I mean, literally, that's what he did. Simply for their faith, he would rip people out of homes, throw them to jail. Instead, it came because of an authentic encounter with the risen Jesus, that that's what dramatically changed his life. I got to do a wedding last night for uh, David and Angela Rothenberg. How many of you know David and Angela? Some of you guys, they've been a part of our church family for about three and a half years. And I always remember when uh, he first came to a church service at the old building, uh, the little building we leased off of College Avenue. Some of you guys remember those days. And I remember him coming in. And at that time, he was of Jewish descent. He had only been in a church service uh, like ours once or twice. And one of them was at a local church that Pastor Darren, who preaches here, uh, had preached at. And the first service he ever went to in church was the service, a few of you know Pastor Darren, and when he did this, where uh, Darren went up to talk about hearing from God in our lives. He read a passage of scripture, and then he got down on his face on the stage and laid there for the next half an hour. Anybody heard that story before? Because he's like, hey, oh, you were there? Because he was like, hey, we believe what we can hear from God, so let's just see what he says to us. So we'll be doing that next week. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> no, uh, but... That was the first time David had ever been to church, and uh, he had been dating Angela, and she was a devout follower of Jesus, a missionary kid, and they had met each other, but they obviously had a big part of their lives that wasn't on the same page because he was an agnostic person. And so um, it so inspired him that Darren actually thought that he would hear from God that uh, he ended up coming to a church service. I don't know if Darren was preaching at Mercy Road or what it was, but I met David, and we got to know each other. And we started meeting. We'd meet one-on-one -on -one in my office for a couple of years. He called it his small group. It was just the two of us. And uh, he asked all of his questions. And I remember the first time I sat down with him in the office, he, he said, okay, uh, here's all the stuff that I'm struggling with, the questions I have. And he's like, you convinced me that Jesus is the son of God and I should surrender my life to him. And I told him, I'm not going to do that. He's like, what are you talking about? You're supposed to try and convert me. I said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I don't think that that's effective. It'll just turn it into an academic debate that we'll sit here for the next 10 years and debate about. I said, as a Christian, I believe not only God is real, but that Jesus lived, died, resurrected from the grave. Because of his crucifixion, he atoned and covered up all of our wrongdoing, that we can have a relationship with the living God because of the grace that we have received and I said, because of that, I believe he's at the right hand of the Father, and that today, I can actually talk to him. I could commune with the living God. And I said, so if he's real, and the things that I talk about as a Christian are real, I don't have to convince you with anything. You just have to get to know Jesus for yourself. So he's like, you're not going to try and convince me? I said, no. Do you pray? He said, yeah. I said, just keep praying and ask these questions to God and see what he says to you. And over time, he did that, and his prayer life developed, and he began to pray more often. And then he struggled with, okay, is this who I'm praying to? Is this Jesus? And he came to me and said, Josh, I just can't. Can you tell me that this is Jesus? I said, I, 
You've been talking to him to, for two years. Why don't you ask him? So he, he went that day and he asked, is, are, you, are you Jesus? Should I call you king and lord of my life? And I won't share the details, but he had an experience where he knew that Jesus was talking to him and he ended up becoming a follower of Jesus. He got baptized in that tank right there. He led our mission trip to Detroit this last year. And I got to, after seven and a half years of dating, I got to marry David and Angela who committed their life to Jesus and were all about him. And it was just an amazing moment. One of those moments you just think would never happen. Tears were going everywhere. So what we're talking about today is important because that didn't just happen in David's life. The passage we read about Saul who will become Paul, that's what happened. He encountered the risen Jesus. Nobody convinced him. He, he met Jesus. And so that transformed his mind and his way of thinking so much. He, he goes on to change the course of human history. I wonder what God's going to do with David and the others of you in the room. We, I don't know if you know this. Uh, two weeks ago, we saw almost 30 people at just two services, almost 30 people give their life to Christ. And yeah, I mean, we can celebrate that because that's a good thing. And, and, and for some, that was a prayer. And, and for some, it will actually lead to a complete life change that we read about Saul and as we've seen in David and other people's lives. And one day, some of you will be getting baptized here and you'll be leading other people in the faith. That's the way that Christianity works. It's not like some mythological made-up thing. And it's also not something we have to twist anybody's arms and make things happen on our own human effort. God's really living and active and he works. And he happened, it happened in Acts chapter 9 and it happens today. We've entitled this series, The Revenge of the Saints. Revenge for us, most of the time when we think about that, that word is that we respond with harm for a wrong done to us. You hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. That's what we do. Look around us today. The life of a Christian in Jesus' life and in Saul who will become Paul and John that I'll talk about next week. Paul in particular today responds with grace for a wrong done. That the revenge of the saints is to respond with grace in that moment. What would that look like in yours, your life and in my life? That's what changed David's life. That's what changed Saul's life. I think it changes people's life today. Will you pray with me? God, we just acknowledge the presence of your Holy Spirit here. Speak to us, God. I don't know what to say. I, I know you're here. Uh, take away my words. And you've been talking to people before they came in this room. So I pray we'd hear you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. You know, Maybe you're not familiar with experiencing grace um, in the biblical sense, but I imagine you've experienced grace in your life. This last week, I mentioned Pastor Luke, I was away on vacation for a week. My amazing wife got the privilege of staying home with our two older children because they were in school. Because uh, she's going to Israel for 17 days in May with her grandfather. And so I took our youngest son, kind of a bonding trip with my two, almost three-year-old son, Jet. And we went to Florida. My parents are retired, and they stayed down there for two months every year. And so got some great sun time. It was a fantastic time. But have you ever taken a two, almost three-year-old boy on a trip or an airplane before? I just want to tell you, that was not the vacation part of the vacation. In fact, uh, my Jet's actually a pretty sweet, funny kid. But as we were leaving, walking out the door to go catch an airplane... I'm going to spare you the details. I don't mean to make you sick this morning, but this is my life. I thought we were almost done with this. He's almost three years old. It's time to get out of the diapers, man. This is our last one. I'm almost free. We're walking out the door, and the details I'll spare, but massive blowout. We all know, like, worst ever, ever. Not only did it run down his pants and ruin all of the clothes that he was wearing and we had to change him and get all over the couch. We had to clean the couch. It actually got on his blanket. He calls it his night night. And it just covered it. We didn't have time to wash it. He won't get on the airplane without it. And we took it and we rinsed it off real quick. We took a hair dryer to it. We're like running out the door and we're like, it's going to be way better. I go to get on the plane and I pull the thing out just reeks, man. <laughs> Smells horrible. And I'm like, oh no, we're going to be the smelly family on the plane. Everyone's going to hate us. I need him to sleep. He won't, do, he won't sleep if he doesn't have the blanket. The smells was the, the least of our problems. I get on the two and a half hour flight back from Florida. 
Not only do we smell horrible, all of a sudden my sweet kid who has never had a problem on a flight ever, and we've taken quite a few, all of a sudden decided to totally lose his mind. Just went crazy. He's screaming at the top of his lungs. He's yelling. He's wanting to get out of the car seat and then uh, let him out. And then he's running up and down the plane, waving at everybody. And then I finally tried to get back. He's just losing. He's going nuts. So I'm like, that's it. I'm going to take him. I'm going to lock myself in the bathroom for the next hour and a half. And then I go to do that, literally, and there's a line waiting to get to the bathroom. And so I've got Jet, and he's just going, he's crazy, isn't he, Jake? My oldest son's right here. He's just going berserk, and he's a tough kid, and I can hardly hold on to him, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs, and I'm like, we're the smelly family, the screaming kids. Like, you ever have a kid on a flight like that, you just wanna wring their neck a little bit, or even worse, you wanna punch the dad? (laughs) Because they're allowing it to happen? And so I'm like, everyone's gonna hate us, this woman behind us, in line for the restroom, she taps me on the shoulder, and I look back at her, and she's got like a three to four year old daughter who was completely well behaved <laughs> and normal, and no one likes them, but she, she looked at me and she said, rather than responding with anger, and you cannot believe you would allow this to happen, like I was probably thinking, she says, hey, I got boys too, I've been there. Other people on this plane have been there. You're going to be all right. We'll be fine. Don't worry about the plane. You know, you could talk about grace, but when someone offers grace to you, it made it much easier for me, at least, to get through the remainder of that flight and treat my son the way you should treat a three-year-old rather than, like, wanting to physically harm him at that moment. Maybe you're struggling with the concept of grace because you don't really understand it. The definition of grace that we're going to be using is undeserved favor and forgiveness. Maybe this last week you have received undeserved favor and forgiveness in your life. You've experienced something like that. It's world change. It's light in the darkness. As Christians, we obviously believe that the sacrifice of Jesus, the crucifixion, resurrection, that we receive the free gift. We don't deserve it of grace in our life from God, that we can know a perfect God and be in his presence, that we can talk with him, not because we deserve it, but he gives us his favor and forgiveness completely undeservedly. And we know these things and we talk about it, but we don't really let it sink in and understand the depth of it the way that Saul did. And I want to share his words with you in the remaining time that we have Because he writes to the church in Rome, this in Romans 3.23, a famous passage for all, not some, all of us in the room and watching online, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have done wrong and aren't perfect. Even those of you who are the good, strong Christians in the room that think you got it all figured out. The Pharisees were the ones that thought they had it figured out. Saul was one of them. But he understands God's grace and forgiveness and that all of us, We may have salvation, we may be going to heaven, but we need his grace on a daily basis in our lives. So if you wanna make a difference today, here's what I wanna share with you. We're gonna fight back with grace. Next week we're gonna fight back with love, but this week we're gonna fight back with grace. If you look at it, I wanted to share very quickly Paul before he experienced grace and then after he experienced grace and the difference it made in his life. And the first thing is this in verses one to two, Paul was actually a pretty bad dude. He, He was a bad guy oversaw the killing of Stephen. He was a murderer, essentially. He was a religious terrorist, ripping people out of their homes and imprisoning them simply for their faith in Jesus. He was a pretty awful person. In fact, in the passage, it refers three times to him actually harming uh, people that would have included women. That, That was what Saul was doing. And yet he encounters Jesus, it changes his life. Uh, Number two, he wasn't just a bad guy, according to those verses. In verses three through eight, he also encounters Jesus, and that's what changed his life. He encounters him in a very real way. Look at verse three with me. As he uh, neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Thank you. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? We read this. Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus whom you have been persecuting. Now get up and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. And he responds with obedience. The men traveling, they couldn't understand what was going on. Now look at verse 8 with me. 
Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. He encounters Jesus. That will cause him to begin the process of this life transformation, which, by the way, took 14 years. He he will eventually, we know from Galatians chapter 1, he will spend 14 years in the wilderness being transformed by Jesus, only to later lead three missionary journeys, each longer than the first, starting churches throughout the Roman Empire, will end up in a prison cell in Rome and writing letters to the leaders that he has raised up during his time of ministry. He was someone that understood complete devoutness to following Jesus, but it didn't come from someone convicting him, it didn't come from someone trying to force feed him, or even trying to apologetically prove the existence of God in his life and the existence of Jesus, it was from encountering him because he's real and it changed his life. But it didn't make it easier. In fact, if you look at verse 9 with me in Acts chapter 9, it won't be on the screen, but in Acts chapter 9 verse 9, it says that he did not eat or drink for three days. He didn't eat or drink anything for three days. You can go without three days with food and you're going to be pretty hungry. Go three uh, days without water and you're on the verge of death. Physically, he's dying. He's completely blind. He was a prestigious man that studied under Gamaliel. He had it going on. He was a Jew among Jews, a Greek among Greeks. Like this was an educated individual who had direct access to the Sanhedrin, the ruling party in Jerusalem. And all of that was ripped away from him the moment he encounters Jesus. See, we often tell people, come and follow Jesus, he'll change your life and it's going to be great. And there is definitely truth to it. It's more meaningful, joy-filled life, absolutely. But there's also number three in this passage, before the grace he's fully received it, Jesus fully ruins and wrecks his life. He's on the verge of physical death. He's lost everything. His career is over. He's got nothing left. He lives for 14 years in the wilderness. Could you imagine what those 14 years would have been like? Some of you have been living them. But it was only because of that experience of allowing Jesus to fully ruin his life that he was transformed. If you want transformation like Paul, start with letting Jesus ruin and wreck your life completely. See, I find a lot of us, we want salvation and we pray and receive the grace of Jesus, but we don't allow the grace of Jesus to encompass and enter into all the areas of our lives. We take these compartmentalized areas that we hide, and we all got them to a certain extent, and we keep them deep beneath, and we don't talk about them with anybody, not even God. In fact, most of the time when we need God the most is when we push him away the most. That's just ironically how human beings work. Rather than inviting in him vulnerably into those areas, allowing him to completely ruin and wreck those areas, and then build us back up into the person he created us to be, That's what you see happen in the New Testament. It's what happens in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says that you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. There's a complete transformation that occurs. The Greek word we use for conversion is actually metanoia. And metanoia means complete change, a complete and utter change. When I first became a follower of Jesus at 19 years old, that's 18 years ago, almost 19 years ago now, I remember my fraternity brothers would look at me and go, dude, what happened to you? And I still had a lot of junk in my life, and I still got issues today. But they said, what happened to you? And all I could say was that there was this complete change in my life because of the power of Jesus when I allowed his grace to come into the difficult things. I don't know what the difficult things on your, are in your life. I can mention just a couple, and maybe it'll spring some ideas. A common one is lust or sexual issues. In fact, Paul writes to the church in Corinth one day, which, by the way, uh, Corinth was a port city. What happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. You tracking what I'm talking about? People come in one night, they leave the next. It was a horrible place. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it talks about a horrible thing that an individual is doing with his mom. That's what's going on. And he writes to that society in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other, other sins a person commits are outside the body. Whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Maybe you're in the, the dating life, or maybe you're married and you're having issues beyond whether with people who are online or any of that kind of stuff. And we don't like to talk about that. Maybe it's a sore subject and maybe there's a lot of shame and guilt that comes with that, but it's not Jesus that wants you to feel that shame and guilt. You understand that? 
When Jesus talks about the love of your heavenly father and the grace that he shows you, he uses this story, this analogy of the prodigal son. The son had this inheritance. He goes out. He lives wildly, lavishly. He prostitutes all kinds of stuff. He wastes it all. He's eating pig slop, and he comes home to his dad, and his, his dad sees him from a distance. He says, hey, get the fat and calf ready. We're having a party tonight. He gets the best robe and ring. He puts the ring on the finger and a robe around him. It says that the, the father, the dad, runs down to see him, which would have been totally indignant in that culture where the robe would been flying up. They didn't have the best undergarments at the time. And he makes it all the way down and wraps his arms around him because his son was lost and he's come home. That's what grace looks like. And so when we acknowledge those areas of our life, it's not God that wants you to feel the guilt and shame and live in that for the rest of your existence. In fact, they believe it's something else. Scriptures refer to it as the enemy or the Hasatan, the Satan or the devil or the adversary. In fact, it may not be your issue. Your issue may be greed. Luke 18, 22 might be for you. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. I don't think this is a commandment for all Christians. I think he knew this individual would never become the person God created them to be, would never be transformed by the grace of Jesus if he didn't surrender that area to him because that was his idol. That was the thing keeping him from following Jesus. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's that. Maybe it was the first one I mentioned. Maybe it's something else. We can come and do this. We can do the church thing all day long until we acknowledge those areas and we invite the grace of Jesus in. We will, it's kind of a waste of our time. We won't see God show up. We won't hear from him. We won't experience those types of things. Not going to be perfect. He just wants you to be honest. And that's what Saul does when he encounters Jesus. It transforms him. And he goes on to change the course of human history with it. The second thing I want to share with you is what happens to Paul after the grace. This is the good news, right? Paul, after God's grace, looks entirely different. In fact, he writes decades later to this protege he had, this young man he had discipled named Timothy. T Timothy had traveled with him on, on one of his missionary journeys, and Paul writes from a prison cell to the city of Ephesus, this, this city that was also a port city that was a little different than Corinth. It was kind of an economic center. In fact, there they worshiped the goddess um, uh, Artemis, also known as Diana. She was a goddess of fertility. is why her chest looks like that. And that city, this was a money maker for them. They had coins and idols and other things that were produced with her image on it. And so it was a money maker for people. In fact, it was thought to be kind of a banking center for the Roman Empire because it was halfway between Rome and the eastern part. And so when you stopped in there, the temple of Diana or the temple of Artemis, they had one of the best vaults in the temple of of any place in the Roman Empire, especially the eastern part. And so this was a very important city. And, and out of this place, the, one of the first megachurches in the early Christianity will happen there in Ephesus by this guy that, that Paul discipled, and he writes to him from a prison cell, and he looks back on the decades and gets to see how God's grace transformed it. You know how it transformed it? Look what he writes to him in 1 Timothy. He says, verse 12 of chapter 1, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though he's in the situations. Verse 13, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, if we're real honest in here, some of us today, many of us today, maybe all of us today in some ways have been a blasphemer, a violent person, an angry person, a jealous person, a hurtful person, a sinful person, we got baggage and shame and guilt. He says this, I was shown mercy, not judgment, mercy, because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Do you get the flavor of what he's sharing here? That he's like, you don't understand, like the grace was poured out abundantly on me. I did not deserve this favor and forgiveness, and yet for some reason, God loved me enough that he did this for me. He says, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And it's not just some ethereal thing about somebody out there somewhere. He says, of whom I am the worst. As we sang about earlier, I deserve all the worst. You make me holy. 
But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, he had sensed the humility, the pride is gone now, he's vulnerable. Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example of those who would believe in him and receive eternal life, and not eternal life from an unpowerful being, but God Almighty, now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. He writes to Timothy and he says, hey, I know it's hard leading and, and being a follower of Jesus and dealing with all of the darkness in this world. It's easy to leave, lose hope and it's easy to turn to people on our news feeds and get angry and bring you know, venomous animosity and look to harm people and get vengeance in a way where you hurt me so I'm going to hurt you. He says, uh-uh, this started with grace and I received it abundantly and I will never forget it. I will never forget it. You know how the church got started in Ephesus? In that city that became this thriving church there, it got started because Paul went in there and they didn't want anything to do with him. They wanted to run him out of town. But you know what he did? He just showed grace. He didn't fight back. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to make you believe. He just pointed him to Jesus and he showed grace. It says in Acts 20, verse 32, Acts 19 and 20 is where it talks about Paul going into Ephesus. It says in verse 32, and now I commend you to God. And to the word of his what? His grace. Because his grace is what is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sacrificed. Can you picture it? He went into Ephesus and they, they have this large amphitheater there. The theater there in Ephesus is huge. It was well known. It was one of the, 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 the whole area of Ephesus with the temple and that is one of the seven wonders of the early world. In fact, in, in this place, they're going to bring him before that theater there and they're going to want to run him out of town. They're going to want to kill him and he just responds according to verse 32 with what again? Grace. Grace is what he fought back with. And that grace, a couple people received the grace of Jesus, and that led to a couple more, and then a couple more, and then thousands of people there in the city of Ephesus. What could he do with you and I today? That's Paul's story. David and Angela just have begun theirs, and David's just begun to experience ministering to others with it, sharing grace, not just receiving it, but sharing it with others. I can't wait to see what he's going to do with that couple. The, the revenge of the saints is to bring grace, and next week we'll talk about love into the world. That's the revenge. Who in your life do you need to show grace to? Because I know there's somebody out there. And they may have harmed you, and I'm not telling you to be fake or act like you do. they don't need to like, make some reparations or ask for forgiveness. That's what repentance is for. However, if you don't lead with grace in your life and be willing to show grace, even when you don't want to, you're going to really struggle to see God show up in your life. If you can't show grace to other people, why is anybody going to show grace to you? That's what light in the darkness looks like. And we'll build more on that next week. As I close out, I just want to share this. I, uh, I had the privilege this last week to interview, uh, along with Jennifer Smith, the, the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks NBA basketball team. First woman ever made a CEO of an NBA team. Um, amazing woman of God who uh, was called into a difficult situation. Those that read Sports Illustrated or ESPN, they, they, uh, sexual harassment culture had developed there, and so she's walked into a really difficult situation and named the interim CEO. And man, when I heard her on the phone describe why she's doing it and how she's doing it and the way in which she's doing it, it would be really easy to walk in that situation and point fingers and, and to bring anger. And, and she's walked into that situation and saying this is a horrible, horrible, horrible thing, but I believe God can transform this. And she has to, you know, she works not in a church, so she wor words it in particular ways. But as I got to know her, man, holy cow, we need more people like that. I don't think it's a mistake when there was darkness and evil in that particular situation that Mark Cuban, of all people, called up Sint Marshall. That's who the interim CEO is. Actually, the band knows Sint. And... As I talked to her, I think she got called up because they had seen in her history, you are a person that offers grace and love and can transform lives. You can be light in the darkness. We're in a dark time. We need somebody like that. We need more people like that, don't we? See, when we fight back with grace in our world, people take notice and they want more of it. They want to experience it. This won't just transform the world. This will transform your marriage. It'll transform your children. It'll transform your workspace. 
your family and your home environment, your friendships, it'll transform your life when you lead with grace the way that Jesus demonstrated grace to you. So as we close, maybe you're here today and you want to begin to fight back with grace in this world. I want to give you the opportunity to do that. God, we just confess we're not perfect and we need you. We need your grace and your forgiveness, God. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve to be in the presence of a perfect God. The reality is for some of us, many of us in the room right now, we feel some guilt and some shame about some stuff we're embarrassed to talk about. We get this beautiful word that we get to do, God. It's called repentance. We get to turn to you and ask for your grace, your undeserved favor and forgiveness in our lives. And maybe that's you right now. Just, I'm not gonna make you do anything, just in the quietness of this moment. Uh, not out loud, you're just gonna confess in the next 30 seconds here, whatever that area of your life that you just need the grace of God for. Take 30 seconds. God, I'm, oh, we're sorry, we don't deserve you. We don't deserve your forgiveness. We don't deserve to have your loving arms run to us and wrap them around us. We don't deserve to be able to talk to you and experience eternal life with you. And yet that's the depth of your grace and love for us. God, may we be world changers, sleeping giants of the faith, awakening to the, not only your reality, but to be changed completely, to bring light in the darkness, to bring grace into the world, to fight back with grace. And maybe there's somebody here right now that if you're really honest with yourself, I'm not gonna make you do anything, you're really honest, you haven't received the grace of Jesus Christ for yourself. You've known about him for years, but you've never really received it. You've never repented and asked for forgiveness. I wanna invite you to do that right now. Pray this with me. God, I need you. I'm sorry for doing life on my own and for the mistakes that's caused me. And I beg for your forgiveness now. And I thank you that you actually run to me. And so right now, in this moment, I surrender my life to you fully, Lord Jesus. May you use me. God, we love you. We give you our lives. We give you this church. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.